<laughs> All right, now, Nancy, take us away. Okay, contrary to popular belief, I am not Jeannie Erickson, but I am at Jeannie Erickson's house. So I look, I, I appear to be Jeannie Erickson, which isn't a bad thing. It's a really good thing, actually. Um, so I'm down here in sunny Arizona buying beads and sorry, I'm not in Minnesota having coffee with Maxine on Monday mornings, but um, so we're just gonna have a really good meeting today, um, starting out with Maxine's joke, which we've are already heard. It's pretty funny. Only some of you have heard. Okay, so here I go. A priest, a rabbit, and a minister go to a bar. And the bartender looks at the three of them and he says to the rabbit, what are you doing here? And the rabbit says, Auto-correct. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, Maxine. I like that. <laughs> good, good. Yeah. So we we have some announcements, right? Yeah. You have the list, um, Rochelle. Did you want to go down your list? Well, why don't we have Becky first? We have, we'll start with the furthest away and end with the soonest. Okay, uh, the State Fair has a display case and up until now, the bead heads have put their display in it and they have generously donated it to UMBS. So we get to fill the display case and it's by the um, office in, the, in that room. It's not a judged piece, it's not a competition, but we wanna show Minnesota, what UMBS can do. The theme is beads connect us because it, we make connections in friendship. We make connections in our bead work. It's, it's about the connections that we make. Uh, your entries need to be in, uh, need to be photographed and sent to either myself or Rochelle by July 15th so that we have time to, to plan out our display. And when you send a picture, please have it display ready. And what that means is if it's gonna be hung on a wall, have it in the frame it's gonna be in. If it's a necklace, you need to have it on, an, on a neck form. And if you don't have one, Rochelle has generously offered to um, loan one to you. Um, so you would need to contact her for that. So we want to show what Minnesota beaters can do. Please help us in this and make something with the theme Beads Connect Us. Thank you. Did you say this was juried? No. Oh, it is. It's not a competition. It's not juried. Not it's juried. just dis a display of what we can do. We just want pictures beforehand so we can know what we have, you know, and get how to set up the display. Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. But if they, if you're asking for pictures by the middle of July, when do they have to have the piece to you and how do they get it to you? Um, we have to have it before we put the display up in state fair. And I guess we're going to have to work out the logistics of, of getting it to me. Um, I actually come to the cities every Wednesday and I'm willing to meet with anyone on, a, on, a, on any Wednesday that, I, that I'm there, you know, and, and you could also probably drop it off at Bobby Beads when Rochelle's working. Yep. Or you could just send it here. If you don't live in the cities, yep. um, you can just send it to Bobby Bead and we will then add it to the, the collection on display. Or you can also get it to me because I'm helping set up. Perfect. Thank you. I was hoping that y'all would. <laughs> yeah, I talked to her about that last one. Thank <laughs> you. Yes, can you hear me? You didn't hear the good news, Doris. Thanks. For um, the state fair is August 25th until September something or another. Through Labor Day. Correct. And so that's why if we have it by the 15th of July, we have a month for you to ship it to us and for us to get our preparations for the layout. 
Mm -hmm. And um, so we're excited that we can connect the world through beads. And, yeah, and Vicki, if you- This is an honor to, to be able to di display our pieces. We'd like to have lots of turnout, ladies. <laughs> Wanna fill the case, exactly, so. And Becky, if you get that information to me, I'll make sure it's on the website. I will do that. Super duper. Thank you so much for that. Or anybody, how big is the case? Is it big enough for lots of people to do? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. it's, it's a, a large case. Uh, six feet tall by 10 feet wide. Awesome. Okay. And then it's probably a foot and a half deep, right, Dora? Right. Right. So we can have hanging things, we can have setting things, we can have all kinds of different. And um, yeah, and it, it doesn't have to be jewelry. It, can, it like I said, it can be a, a picture in a frame. If you know, if if it's got beads in it, it can be anything you can imagine. Oh, exactly. Yep. So then we have Roberta talking about the bead retreat. Is that yes? Is Roberta even here? I thought I saw you sign in. Beady bird, no? Oh, I thought I saw her too. I, I don't see her. I thought she was here. Maybe she's, she's having she's internet. Maybe, yeah, she's maybe having issues and we maybe have to come back to her after. Right. I'm teaching a class. I think yeah, that was part of what she was going to announce at the bead retreat. The information is on the website, but yeah, Doris is teaching a class for the retreat. And um, I think you have also Lisa and Doris, are you both setting up shop for it too? Or I am. Lisa, are you too? Um, I don't know yet. You're still okay then we will have more information on that to come. Um, but it is starting a day early. It's Wednesday through Sunday. So that's the extra special news is you have more time to play with your friends. <laughs> well, the other thing is that there's only 24 people. That's our max. So sign up soon. There you go. I'm sorry, what was that again? What kind of classes? It's the bead retreat. Oh, bead retreat, okay. How many people are signed up? We don't know. Roberta's not here. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. <laughs> At least a half a dozen. <laughs> and um, so let's see what else is on the list here. I have a question for Doris. Um, are you doing the taxes this year? I did them already. I sent an email to Nancy to let her know the board so she could let the board know. Oh, really? Yeah. I think we okay, covered because, it. Okay, because the, the figures kind of changed a little bit, separating them between um, PayPal and, and uh, um, membership dues. Leave it. Um, Discuss it more at the- what, ta what taxes are you talking about? 2021. No, I take care of the federal taxes and right. the Minnesota State uh, Corporation registration. What if there's no other taxes that we have? Right. The, I'm talking about the federal. Well, yeah. the federal and the state. Yeah. There well, is no state taxes that we owe. For the no, meeting. but you still have to file, even though it's zero. The only thing we do not have a resale number with the state as far as I know unless you guys got one no 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 then there's nothing to file for state taxes okay the only thing we have to file is the renewal of the corporation which I did all right and then I have to the federal taxes I did at the same time I did those both of those the first week in January oh there's Berta no it's Berta it's not Roberta Cool. Okay, and and Michelle, I had I was going to say something about the blog. Thank you. I was going to say that's the next on the list. <laughs> all right, very good. Okay, so so I'm sure all of you are aware because you've got an email uh, that instead of doing a newsletter every two months, 
we're, we're putting the information in a blog page on the UMBS website. Um, so, you know, and, and most of the, uh, about half of the information that we put in the newsletter is actually already on the website. So we want people to get used to using the various pages on the website. The, um, the website uh, blog page is password protected and the email that you got has the, the um, uh, uh, password for it, which is BEADS, capital B-E-A-D-S. Um, so we encourage you to look at that. Also, if you have information or things that you want to pass along, um, uh, you know, send them to me and we'll, uh, we'll get them on the blog. And the blog we can update, you know, in a day's notice. Um, so we'll be regularly updating the blog at least monthly. Uh, but other information now, there's, there's I, think, I think that now maybe Nancy has been trained as well as... Uh, um, uh, you know, so there's three of us now that are, are actually updating the, the, uh, the blog. Um, Jan, question, yeah. is the password um, case sensitive? Yes. So then it's all capitals. No, it is not. It's capital B, lowercase E-A-D-S. Okay, because when I... that was an email that went out to everybody. Right, but uh, what I saw was it was all caps. That's why I'm clarifying. No, I thought it was just all bold, but um, it wasn't all caps. It was bold. Well, bold is the same. No, it's not. But so does it have to be bold? No, no. OK. Is the links then for Maggie um, are private? We're recording this and then we're uploading these to our private YouTube channel. So if anybody misses our Monday meetings, you'll be able to see them again. And so in the blog, are we then posting the link to the private meetings at all, Maggie? So people can find it easy there or how do people find the private we link? We can, um, I, I, I haven't done it yet, but uh, Jan and I need to talk about that and it can certainly be done. Um, now yeah. I'll put the Zoom link on, um, the website for our free Let's Be Live. So people can just click from the website and just go to the free Saturday classes. But for the, um, to get to our private YouTube channel, easy, right. wouldn't that be a great way to do it? Is yeah. Blog? It's, yeah. It's perfect. Yeah. yeah. Just, it's, it's, I, Jan and I just haven't talked about it yet. Right. So yes, absolutely. I think that's a great idea. What it's classes cool. are going to be taught? What is going to be taught? At the retreat? Yeah. Well, Doris is teaching. What are you teaching, Doris? Um, it's a necklace called Statila necklace. And um, then I'll also have a free pattern for some uh, snowflakes. Awesome. And Lisa, are you going to teach at retreat at all or anybody else? That we know of, I know Roberta's not here yet. I just wasn't sure what else was planned at the moment. Hey Dave, check this out. Um, yeah, let me think on that, and then I will get back to you. Okay, if that's okay. Yeah, I know. When do you need to know by? It's Roberta and everybody. It's 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 what your whatever your thing is. So okay, Roberta. Okay, sounds good. Since she's not here, I was just answering and following through on some questions. <laughs> I, I have a question. Yes. For the um, recorded Zooms, um, it's on the YouTube. Do is that password protected? There are some, and I'll jump in here and answer that because I've uploaded all of them to our YouTube channel. And <laughs> uh, right now, I have a public YouTube channel and a private one. So all mm -hmm. the Let's Be Live. Beating Basics Live from last year are all on the public one. And I'm trying to figure out how to get that link to the private one to work just privately. And um, yeah, so that, that's where that's at. Yeah. As soon as I get that figured out, um, you know, that might be another thing that we put into the blog too, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, you know, put that link into the blog so that that's just for members only. 
Yep. Otherwise, it's also the private Facebook group. We can put links to things there too. I just know not everybody Facebooks. So that's why um, we'd like it in a couple different places to make it easy for everybody. So other than that, was there anything else on the list of announcements? So I just wanted to remind everybody about our Let's Be Live on the 19th. So if anybody tunes out early, you at least have heard it. We are having three instructors for the 19th. Mm. And it is um, first off, we have Lisa teaching the first of her beaded beads series. And it is um, a really fun little um, beaded bead that uses two whole cabochons and teacups and some demis and 11 O's. So the pattern and everything is um, on the, uh, the, the website, obviously. And I believe Lisa might have kits, but there's a supply list there too. So gather your supplies for that. Second, we have Candy Sexton teaching us the basics of bead crochet. So it's from point A to get yourself started. And so what crochet, what needles, what everything of how not to be afraid to actually get started and do basic bead tubular crochet. And then um, she will also be our March 7th um, speaker for the Monday night doing advanced bead crochet, how to load it on, how to get all your patterns, how to do finishing techniques, all that kind of stuff. So it's a whole big, wonderful exploration of bead crochet. And then thirdly, on the 19th, I will be teaching Unicorn Tears again, the pattern by Alexandra Sidorenko. I now have more kits and all kinds of different colors. And we also have supplies if you just wanna make up your own. Um, and that will be from two to three or three to four on that Saturday. And so if you haven't done any unicorn tears or wanna do some more, that's our fun. So until then, um, if you wanna volunteer to teach any of our Let's Be Live Saturdays, just get in touch with me. We're looking for teachers for the whole rest of the year and so. Uh, I have a question, um, Rochelle, yes. it's Robin. Yes. Um, is there interest in me teaching uh, right angle weave? If there is interest, let Rochelle know. And so I don't, some people know how to do it, some don't, and I don't want to be repeating myself. If yep. it's, so if you would, on the side note, let her know. Um, Oh, by the way, hello, I'm Robin. I was gonna say, we have a couple new members. This is Robin Simon Seeley, recently oh, from yeah. Texas to Colorado. And um, you were in the Texas Bead Guild for a while, right, Robin? Uh, Texas Bead Society. Um, and I had a piece on, I have a piece on, a poster of a piece in the airport. So that's all, I was on display. So that's impressive. Awesome. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. You can Google my name, but just make sure to spell it weirdly. So um, <laughs> oddly. Yes, I have an you odd name. Two N's and an E. It only took her how many years to get it? But you I know, know. I, I, I'm a slow learner. But, so um, yeah, um, but if there's a Rochelle and I uh, struggled with it years and years and years ago. So if there's interest in it, I can also teach it. So, and it's very helpful because you can do, you can build on it and change the look of your work. Yep. Rochelle, and, Roberta just joined us. Mm -hmm. Perfect, Roberta, anything else you wanna say on the bead retreat? She has to unmute. Oh, I'm scrolling through the people. Roberta, you're gonna- Roberta, you need to unmute. Rochelle, yeah. it would if for the raw, it would be nice to have a project, a, a, a small project to do from Robin. Versus just a stitch, correct? Okay, that makes sense. Um, there, I can give you examples of things to do. Can you send them to me, Robin, and we'll plan. Um, and 
Gotcha. All right, Roberta, were you here? You were here a second ago. He looks frozen. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll then get back to you, Roberta, on that, because uh, if you're stuck, I don't know what's going on. Why don't we then head to our main feature event? Yeah. We have a bad internet connection, so I'll try to brief. Oh, okay. Um, Okay, is everybody having terrible internet connection or is it just it might be just Roberta. So can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So then let's just get Karen and March starting Wednesday. Roberta, your feedback central. Maybe Roberta could um, chat what she's trying to say, like, might work. Yeah, could you type it in the chat, Roberta? Yeah, <laughs> Sorry for all the technical glitches, um, but... We'll have Roberta chat her her messages. Um, Are you hearing me now? It's really no. bad. Uh, Sorry, Roberta. Why don't you just chat it in there and we'll just go to Karen and um, start. We talked about it while you were gone. Well, I don't know. Uh, it's not working, Roberta. I think we're going to give up for now on that. <laughs> so why don't we just go to Karen, our feature speaker of the night. Um, and that's what I'm trying to do right now. No, we're going to give up, Roberta. Sorry. That's what we trying to do. <laughs> it's a new language you're speaking. <laughs> All right. Sorry. We'll have a British chat. Okay. Why don't you start, Karen? Take it away. We got Karen Bruins for us tonight doing everything we want to know about fused glass and a whole lot of other topics. You're muted, Karen. <laughs> I don't know why you're muted. I was calling in through the I was calling in through the phone so that we could have clear connection. Okay, try again. Up and we'll just go through here. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. We live in the country, so normally uh, once a day-ish, our internet sounds just like Roberta's. So, so I thought, well, I'll call in and I'll try to avoid all of that for you. Um, so if it gets rough, just let me know, okay? Uh, so we're going to start with um, introduction to class. And uh, you're all going to get the PDF at the end of this. Um, so we're going to be looking at introduction to fused glass for 
jewelry, and we're going to be exploring outcomes of intention. So I'm going to tell you about some of the experiments that I've run and how they have come out. And I, I actually run another batch of experiments just for this particular presentation so that you can get to see uh, what things look like against light and dark backgrounds and how, well, it changes see. and how it brings different color to life. Uh, so just the one frame at a time here. And um, so I want to start with the first three things that I think are the most important things for any glass studio. And um, the moment that you get a kiln and a few of the tools, you can say you have a, um, a glass studio. <laughs> So that can be kind of fun. Um, my glass studio is my garage. And <clears throat> because of that, we've got clean workspace and safety as two of the topics. And so those are three most important things. COE, who knows what the COE is? Anybody heard of the COE? If you have, just come off mute and, and say what you know it to be. Coefficient of expansion. No, I got some people talking, looking like they're on mute. So um, the COE is the coefficient of expansion. And it really, all that means is that it's a measurement of the rate that glass expands and contracts when it's heated and cooled. Um, as such, they have different firing schedules. And so when we talk about how we're going to fuse the glass, uh, the numbers that we put into the kiln or the temperatures, those are called firing schedules. <clears throat> so if we wanna file, excuse me, fuse multiple pieces of glass together, it's important to use glass that's compatible because there are different coefficients. Right. Um, there, I know of two for fusing glass. Uh, one is um, 90, COE 90, and the other is COE 96, also called system 96. My preference of the two is COE 90. Um, the reason that I like it is there are more colors, <laughs> more colors and more types of glass to choose from. So your playground is bigger, and bigger, which is fun. Um, and it doesn't really matter which one you choose. System 96 does have some different um, type of colors and some different reactions um, than does COE 90. But once you choose, decide what you're going to be and make that what's in your glass studio because mixing the two of them um, won't go real well. <laughs> so it doesn't matter what one you choose, but once you choose there, stay with that one. So we don't ever want to mix COEs in the kiln. The best case scenario is your glass is going to crack as a cool. Worst case scenario, it can destroy your kiln and make a huge mess that you have to clean up as well as ruin most, if not everything in your kiln. Now, thankfully, I had a glass teacher who shared horrible stories and photos um, and um, costs involved because if you destroy your kiln, oof, kind of pricey. So um, I ne luckily never had to experience any of that because she hammered home, you know, the fact of keeping your COE consistent. Um, so I use Bullseye. Bullseye is 100% COE 90. They don't have other um, coefficients in there, which is nice because then you don't have to worry about it. You can mix anything. Um, there is also, when I talked about um, COE 96 or System 96, uh, they have two brands that they call Spectrum or Euroborus, which is spelled U-R-O-B-O-R-U-S. And that gives you some different colors um, and um, reactions to play with. So let's talk about our clean workspace next. Um, easy for all of us to get messy, especially when we bead, right? Can I get hands up? Yes, messy beaters. Yeah, any organized beaters here today? Go ahead and raise your hand if you're an organized beater. Um, so yeah, messy when we bead, but with glass, it's a little more challenging to work in a messy space. Um, it doesn't mean that I always clean up after I play. Mm -mm, sometimes I don't, <laughs> but I do have to clean up before I start on the new project. And I almost have to clean up even after I, I play and before I start to play with something new. Even if I've, um, if I've skipped it, I definitely have to start before I start playing with something new. And here's why. Um, glass is sharp and the shards or the splinters um, or even small powdered frits, they're even more unfriendly. Um, they're lightweight. They can blow around really easily. I live in um, Tracy, California, which means that I live in a wind tunnel. So in my garage, I can walk out there at any given afternoon and I can see things swirling in my garage, which means that I need to have that glass picked up or when I go to do laundry in, the, in my bare feet, I'm going to get a reminder I didn't clean up afterwards. <laughs> Um, so I use a shop back 
and I have a four gallon uh, shop vac and it is used solely for that, nothing for, for nothing else. I don't use it for inside the house. I don't use it for other places. Once you get a shop vac and you dedicate that to your glass studio, don't use it for anything else because of some of the things that we're gonna talk about a little bit later, okay? Um, you want to keep your glass environment free of dust when working. My shop is in my garage, like I mentioned, so it's dusty. And this means I have to include that extra step of cleaning process at the beginning anytime I play. Uh, I have to de-dust my environment. <clears throat> glass is really particular about dust. Um, dust will show up in all different kinds of ways on your glass. It can completely destroy the design. Um, it can um, make edges look burned. It can make the top of it look burned. Um, it can leave uh, spots on it that you can't get off. Um, <clears throat> so, and when I say that you can't get off, if it's hitting, if it's landing on the top. So let's say that we haven't cleaned out our kiln because even you even have to clean out the kiln. Let's say I haven't cleaned out my kiln and there's a couple of little pieces of dust that are big enough to see. I can see that there's a little, dark spot on the bottom of my kiln and it's like, ah, it's probably not a big deal. Well, once that heats up, there's gonna be movement in that kiln as the glass expands. And I actually had a couple of pieces in this last batch where I got a couple of little um, black spots on the top. Depending on how deep they are, I might be able to get them out and refire, but I might not. So I won't usually spend the time to do that. Um, or I usually will like take the, the piece and I'll toss it into a pile. And when I get a few of them, then I'll throw them in the tumbler and tumble them until the black spots go away. Um, because I live in the country, because it's dusty, no matter how good I clean my kiln, there's always like one or two little dust specks in there that are going to wreak havoc. So I get my little collection of things that I need to fix. And then I'll take a day where I fix the mistakes. <clears throat> So let's talk about some safety. Um, safety is a, a paramount concern. Uh, I talked about the shop back a little bit. And one of the reasons that it's important to have a dedicated um, vacuum system for your glass studio is so that when you're cleaning out the kiln, I'm gonna tell you there's a couple of ways that you can do this. You can bake on a, a sheet of paper called Thin Fire. And that is one word with a capital F. So T-H-I-N-F-I-R-E. Um, I prefer that over kiln wash. And the reason that I prefer it is it's 100% of the time will not stick to my kiln shelf. Um, I have a little bit of a trouble telling exactly how thick to get the kiln wash. And so sometimes I'll lose a piece and, um, you know, the glass is expensive and it's pretty to play with and I don't want to waste it. So I tend to use the thin fire. Thin fire after it's cooked is going to um, be a micro dust and you're gonna need a respirator. So you're gonna to wanna to get a decent respirator. I would not recommend that you go to Harbor Freight for your respirator. You can go there for some of your hammers and some of your other things when you're experimenting with other types of jewelry, um, but I would not go there for the safety equipment. <clears throat> um, so buy a good respirator. Uh, safety glasses are a must as well. Uh, one of the tools that you'll see later in the presentation I have is a glass grinder and a tile saw. And those like to send little bits of glass into orbit. So wearing um, a pair of safety glasses is super important. I also have a pair of closed toed garage sneakers. So I don't bring those in the house. When I step out to go into my glass studio, those are the sneakers I put on. I also turn them upside down and I tap them a few times after I'm done using because glass, again, super tiny, it's gonna go in the smallest of places. <clears throat> um, have dedicated towels for your shop. The other thing that um, I have is a dedicated roll of paper towels that I keep in a plastic bag. I keep it in the plastic bag because I don't want it to attract additional dust. And the paper towels are great to use to clean off the glass um, Windex, cheap Windex, uh, you'll see in one of the videos that we're going to look at today. Uh, it doesn't have to be fancy. It's just something to help clean the glass. <clears throat> My shop vac has a HEPA filter, uh, super important. It's going to filter out the tiniest of those micro dusts. And the reason, like when you get into the kiln, um, after it's uh, opening up, it's finished baking, you want to be wearing the respirator because once you open that up, that micro dust, even the slightest breeze will pick up tiny bits of it 
And I don't know the name of the lung disease, but I can tell you from one of the um, glass teachers I had that she tells me it's very painful. She's seen people um, with it. She's met people that told the story, don't not wear your respirator, wear your respirator. Um, plus it's a fun opportunity to scare your kids or your grandkids. <laughs> makes a great picture. I'm going as a glass artist for <laughs> Halloween. So are there any questions about consistency of the coefficient, the clean workspace or safety? No questions? I have a question. Okay. Can you hear me? So some of the tools that I work with, um, I work with nippers. They're also called CG pliers and um, they have a little bag. And as you're like um, chopping off little tiny pieces of glass, you can chop off pieces of glass in triangle shapes. And so if you have, let's say um, a square piece of glass, we'll just say this guy right here, okay? I can nip off pieces of the corners as I go along. Why would I wanna use that? So why I would wanna use that is I might do mosaic work. I might wanna make a mosaic pendant and I want little shards of glass that are unique shapes. Um, they make really pretty flowers, really pretty flowers. Um, so roses are really beautiful with nippers. Um, your running pliers are to help break the glass after um, you've scored it. And scoring is what we'll do with uh, some of the cutting tools. Did someone have a question? It looks like there might've been a question in the- There was. Yeah. I have a question, can you hear me? Yeah. What did um, it's Hannah. Karen, where do you get your stuff or are you going to talk about okay. that later? We'll keep going. <clears throat> um, running pliers, again, after you score the glass with a cut part of a cutting system, um, you will um, use the running pliers and there's part of the video will show you how we break it. Um, grosing pliers are just another type of plier that is also a breaking plier. Uh, the portable workstation, love my portable workstation. I'll tell you about that in a little bit. We also use some glass cutting systems, some waffle boards, uh, pistol grip and handheld cutters, glass grinder, tire, tile saw, tumbler, and the kiln. And let's see, Hannah says, I'd like to know where you get your stuff, Karen, or are you going to go into it later? Oh, I'm not even gonna go into it later at all. I'm gonna go into it next. <laughs> So in your um, PDF that you will get, all of these are links to go directly to the place to purchase, okay? Um, and so um, we've got, and, and they're from several different places, okay? So we've got the cutter. Uh, this is that what I told you about that little bag and um, how it's got the little tiny pieces. Our breaking or grozer pliers. And you'll notice that this has kind of a narrow jaw. You see that? It's for breaking tinier pieces, okay? So let's say that you have a piece of glass and we'll say that this is the piece of glass and you just wanna cut off like an eighth of an inch. It's, it's just an eighth of an inch too big. So you're gonna score it at that eighth of an inch mark and the breaking pliers will allow you to break a smaller piece. The grosers will. The running pliers are for if you have something larger than like a quarter of an inch, okay? <clears throat> and you'll see how um, the running pliers are used in the video that I'll show you in a little bit. Um, there's also a handheld cutter. So you can um, hold it just like a pen and draw on the glass with any kind of a shape that you would like to cut. Now, you may have to use the breaking pliers and alternate between the running pliers and the breaking pliers. Um, the pistol grip cutter, that's if I'm cutting like a, a larger section and I wanna make um, maybe some strips. Uh, I'm gonna, just gonna go right straight through there. The handheld cutter is more for freehand. Um, and then there's glass cutting systems and um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So um, let's go into, hang on here. So the glass cutting systems <clears throat> that you see down here, this is a link to just one of them. Once you get into um, Bullseye's uh, shop site and their, um, and there's Delphi also, um, there's other cutting systems there. There isn't one cutting system that I found that allows me to cut every single shape that I want to play with. Um, they usually will have like, here's your standard starter cutting system, uh, which is great until you wanna start making circles. <clears throat> uh, when you wanna start making circles, that's a separate cutting system. Triangles or angles, separate cutting system. 
And um, so you'll see the portable workstation off on the right. And I love my portable workstation because if I feel like I need to uh, pick it up and move, you know, I can do that. Um, if I want to scoot the table over and, and work closer to the kiln, for example, um, I just roll the thing up, move over there, and that's where I start. Let's see. Yes, you can get the tools at any stained glass studio or online app. And Delphi Glass does have catalogs you can order online. And Bullseye has a fantastic store. I love them. Um, AAE Glass is another one. So A is an apple, A is an apple, E is an elephant, glass.com. And you can get some beautiful dichroics there. Beautiful dichroics. <clears throat> They also do some custom dichroics and they did a custom dichroic for me one year for bead and button and um, it went over really huge and I have quite a bit of it left so I'm super excited about that. Bullseye is addictive. <clears throat> the um, pistol grip cutter and the handheld cutter they're self-oiling so I don't know if um, what you guys know about glass and um, diamond heads but these have diamond head um, tops and as the the diamond head goes across the glass it brings up a little bit of heat the heat um, could cause it to kind of veer off track. Um, the oil helps it slide stay, stay straight and stay on the path that you're wanting to cut it. Keeps it from heating up too. <clears throat> um, glass cutting systems that cut the different shapes can be rather pricey. And I have yet to find one that does everything that is um, also affordable. <clears throat> so, Let's see, what else do I want to tell you about this? The, we'll go next onto the, the waffle boards. So the waffle grids or the waffle boards as I call them, they have their own form of measurement. And each of these little squares that are on here are recessed. So where you see the little square, the little white squares in here, it's a recess. You'll see it in the video that I'm gonna show you a little bit later. So that's actually one of the things I have to clean up after. And the best way that I have found to clean that up is um, if you have some of that, like a roll of craft paper uh, or a, a, a paper grocery bag even works, cut that thing open and make it flat <clears throat> and then put your waffle boards on top. And then as you're going to clean, you can simply turn the waffle grid over the top of the um, paper and then scoot the paper up and then you can pour it back into um, either the container that it came from if you're working with Fritz which are tiny pieces of glass, or if you're working with uh, leftover pieces, you can just toss them into a single um, canister or something. <clears throat> Thank you, Hannah, for putting those links in. I appreciate that. Um, the next thing that, that I, um, probably my favorite one, <laughs> it's my beloved gra glass grinder. I love this thing because it allows me to do all kinds of different things. Um, actually, one more thing I want to say about the waffle grids. They're about, each square is about a half an inch. And so it allows you to um, even put a ruler on top and they have rulers that, that stick to them. Um, and you can just score right perfectly. Um, I use them freehanded without the ruler. If I'm working on things that are pretty small, most of the time I'm working on pendant size uh, or bracelet size. <clears throat> and um, so I don't need like a huge cutting system. And um, you need the huge cutting systems when you're getting into doing some of the slumping in molds. If you're making dishes or things like that, the huge cutting systems can come into place. But these waffle grids, I like them because I can just use my oil cutter and just follow that ridge that's underneath. I can see where it is and um, just use it to cut. Um, my, my glass grinder helps me get the sharp edges. So even if I have, uh, say for example, this guy, I'll hold him up to the screen. I don't know if you can see him or not. He's not perfectly square. He was cut perfectly square, but because when I had fired him originally, because there was a rounded edge on one side, what happened when I cut him is it's a little bit wonky, a little bit off. And it's probably okay for bead embroidery, but if, if you're neurotic like I am about perfectioning, <laughs> making something perfect, um, the glass grinder can help with that. So, so can the tile saw if it's too off. <clears throat> All I can see is the screen you're sharing. Yeah, that should be correct. 
What other screen are you wanting to see? I don't know. We can also see your I face you, as well. I can see your face as well. Yeah, I can so, see your face. So those are the two things you should all be seeing is Karen's beautiful face and then her screen share. Okay, I'm not sure why I can't hear. Um, yeah, so right now I'm just sharing. Um, it should be, you should be seeing the PowerPoint. Can somebody give me a thumbs up if that's what you're seeing? Okay, great. <clears throat> so the glass grinder, um, I will use it to take the sharp edges off. I'll use it to kind of um, shape things up. Um, I've also used it to create new shapes by taking larger chunks off. Um, I now have a Gemini ring saw, which I didn't put a picture of here because I haven't used it yet. Um, but the, the Gemini ring saw will allow me to cut on the fly. So I can actually run a piece of glass with an angle like this, and I can run like six pieces of glass at one time through that. And in doing that, I can make my base, I can make my dichroic center, and I can make my clear glass top all at the same time so they perfectly match. So I'm excited about that. So maybe, maybe in the future, we can do another one on just that. <clears throat> so the tumbler um, is how I use, is what I use to polish the glass to get a matte finish or to get some of those black spots out when they happen. Um, I used to do this by hand with a diamond bar underwater and it's like super laborious, you know, and then you're, you have to do it underwater because of the friction and because of the heat that is generated on the glass. But one weekend I was so tired and I thought, I, I, you just can't even talk me into, you know, doing this diamond bar thing again. And I had just gotten the tumbler and I thought, you know, I wonder. And so I threw the rocks or excuse me, threw the glass into the tumbler and um, decided to go to bed. I left it overnight, got up the next morning, checked on it. And I was so delighted because it had done all the work for me. It had taken, um, um, even uh, price tags. I had thrown in a couple of extra things and I thought, you know, I couldn't get these price tags off. It even took the price tags off. So it was great. So um, I used to show at the bead and button show and I would bring home things and then think, okay, I'm going to put a sale on these. And um, I wanted to put new price tags on, or, you know, somebody had told me at the booth, there were a couple of people that said, you're not selling this for enough. You need to put another couple of dollars on this. So I thought new price tags, throw these in the tumbler. It took care of everything. Um, so let's, um, let's talk a little bit about what kind of glass I'm putting in here. So I'm not putting into the tumbler, I'm not putting dichroic glass in. Um, I'm putting opalescent glass in, which means opaque glass in the glass world. I'm putting something on that if I am running it through and the top layer comes off to reveal the mat, that it's not going to make an uglier um, you know, choice. <clears throat> so um, I don't put the dry cork in. I did try and experiment on it with a piece of dichroic that was just kind of, it just didn't sing when it came out of the kiln. And most of the glass sings when it comes out of the kiln. <laughs> and this one didn't, right? No harmony, nothing. <laughs> so I was like, all right, you're not singing. You're going in with the tumbler. Let's see what happens. And part of the reason that I put it in there too was it had a black background and the dichro itself was black with just some odd shaped triangles of green and gold. And so I thought, well, this is going to be interesting to get the top of that mat with such a dark um, black um, background. And then just these random little things, I thought maybe it would look like it was an opal. You know how you can get some of those little flecks in there. And so I thought, well, maybe it would look like that, but it didn't. It, um, the result was less than phenomenal. So um, it, did, it was, dichroic wasn't meant to stand out in a crowd if you mat it. So it does not want to be muted. <laughs> So I ended off um, throwing it back in the kiln with the next batch and it shines right back up. So <clears throat> um, the last thing that I'll talk to you about is um, the tile saw. The tile saw is uh, simple, like Home Depot. As a matter of fact, I think this one, this in the tumbler, I think I, I put Amazon links in because they were cheaper than getting them at Home Depot. And the tile saw is basically a wet dry saw. So in this little port that's right down here, um, you pour water into it. And so water will come up, it shoots up through here and um, uh, you get pretty wet. Like your arms are gonna get pretty wet and your arms are gonna get coated in little tiny pieces of glass. So I like to wear 
something that is long sleeved. Or the other thing that I've started doing is I take a paper towel and I wrap it around my arm and I make it wet. And then I just peel it off afterwards and all the little tiny glass shards are on there and I put them in the trash. Let's see, we've got maybe a comment or question. What medium do you put in the tumbler? 1200. Oh. And I use the silicone carbide. Yeah. Um, the kiln, um, I didn't put a picture of the kiln in. There's all kinds of kilns. The kiln is, I like to say the kiln is two parts fine art, one part mystery, a dash of experience and a smidgen of luck. <laughs> So you never quite know what you're going to get. Um, I started with a slightly used kiln that was eight inches and that was fine for a few years. Um, but once I became a vendor at the Bead and Button Show, I needed quicker production, more production. So I upgraded and bought a slightly larger one with a digital programmable controller, which means I can choose different settings for the different types of firings that I have. In the hot, so Hanna says, in the hot glass shop, we call this cold working, and it can be really fun in the summertime when it's 90 degrees, not so fun in the winter. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <clears throat> yeah, you can actually take that uh, silicone carbide grit and put it on a stainless steel table, add the water to it, and you can just hand work it as well. <clears throat> So different types of glass, uh, different types of glass that I work with. So there's opalescent, transparent, clear, reactive, um, gold glass, marine glass, dichroic scrap packs, and textures and stringers and fritz. And so we're going to talk about all those right now. Um, so the first thing to know about fusing in a glass kiln or glass in a kiln is that all glass desperately wants to be six millimeters. It's like somebody said, when they were baby glass, you know, hey, when you grow up, you need to be six millimeters and they've all taken it to heart. And what that means is, so glass comes in different size thicknesses, uh, two millimeter, three millimeter, if you're buying the sheet glass. Uh, so if you use a base that's two millimeter, and a lot of times I'll use a black base, um, and then you use a die crow that's say three millimeters, and a clear that is two millimeters, it's going to spread out until it basically spreads out to the point where it's about six millimeters thick. It'll stop spreading out. It won't go any further than that. Um, if you use no clear on top, it'll pretty much remain the same shape and size. And if you use only a two millimeter piece of dichro by itself, it will actually pull in on the edges making the sides indented like this and the top the same way. I don't even know if I can do that backwards. <laughs> I can't do that backwards. Anyway, it makes sharper points on the square. So if you think about a square that's gone like this and up, you know, and then the divots are on each side. So it pulls in the center of the edge towards the center of the glass, desperately trying to get to six millimeters. And it can't, so it comes to a point where it has to stop. So I pay attention to the thickness of, thickness of the glass um, when I'm both buying and when I'm designing. So let's talk about the different uh, glasses. So opalescent um, in the glass world, it's considered opaque glass. Like, so if you think about your beads that are opaque, you can't see through them, um, that's what opalescent glass is. Transparent, exactly what it sounds like. You can see through it a little bit. Um, they come in all different colors. Transparent also comes in um, this other kind of glass called transparent with stringers. Um, and it, it looks literally like a party is happening inside of the, um, of the glass, uh, confetti, if you will. That's even one of the names of it. Um, it's, not, it's not my speed. I don't really care for it, but um, there are those that really like it. <clears throat> Clear, exactly what it sounds like. Um, and you can get different uh, thicknesses in the clear two or three millimeter. Uh, dichro, same, two or three millimeter. Once you start incorporating texture into the glass, um, you're going to increase to three millimeters, okay? So if you're planning on something with texture, um, then you know that's uh, something to consider. Um, reactive, we'll talk about reactive in just a minute. Um, and the gold, murine, so murine, there's, it's really hard to find COE 90. Uh, you can find some at Bullseye. Um, 
I'm not a fan of like the simple smiley face marine or, um, you know, the plus or whatever there's like, or a heart, you know, I, I like different kinds of Marine. And so um, I actually had paid uh, and, and this is something that glass artists that I've worked with in the past have been used to, they've been, or not used to open to. Uh, and that is, I'll tell them, Hey, look, these are the colors that I'm interested in. I'll buy the, um, the rods, the glass rods, have them shipped to you. If you'll make a Marine for me. Um, I've had roses made. The roses were a complete bomb. So when you're thinking, if you think about lamp working, you've got, you know, the ball of glass and then you've got this marine piece and you're working the flame in such a way that it's opening that rose in fusing. It doesn't want to open. It just wants to kind of stay where it is and flatten out a little bit, but it, it doesn't open this way, which is what you need for the rose to come to life. It actually kind of goes in and out this way, which kind of ruins um, the look of the marine. Um, there was a woman who made, um, some that were, they had like a white center, white circle in the center, and then they had a red edge. And then she had put white edges around the outside. And when those went into the fuse in the kiln full, full fuse, they, um, they actually ended up looking like the, the tube tubes in the ocean. Like they looked like they were swaying. And then, um, she made some dory fish for me. And um, so, you know, you can do all kinds of things with it, but I like to see if there's an artist that's willing to let me buy them some glass, then they make me some marine. Um, Decorate scrap packs. Uh, I get the scrap packs because as a jewelry maker, um, one thing that I have found is that beaters and bead embroideries, they like something that's a little bit different than anybody else. I'd like to have my own unique thing, right? And so I don't make, uh, I don't mass produce the dichroic. So the scrap pack is um, a good way for me to get dichroic at a reasonable rate. It already comes in some strange shapes. And so sometimes that um, provides a little bit of creativity as well. Uh, textured, we'll talk about stringers are like, mm, stringers are half of a millimeter to one millimeter in uh, diameter. And they are about some are 17 inches, others are 17 and three quarters inches. Um, I like those because you can break them with your hand. You don't have to score them. And so if you break them with your hand, just like you would spaghetti noodles to put in the pan, um, you can uh, layer them side by side, diagonally on a piece of glass and then tile saw it later. And then you've got color that's blending diagonally into a cabochon, really pretty. Uh, Fritz, Fritz you can paint with. So, and there's glass paints as well. Uh, but Fritz, you can paint with. Fritz come in powder. They come in, um, i trying to think of some of the different shapes or different sizes. Powder, tiny, medium, large, and then the super chunky, which uh, you'll get to see in the river glass uh, tutorial. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit um, about, well, let me tell you one more thing about gold. Let me jump back there. So how many of you have ever purchased a piece of glass that is has been gold fumed? Anybody? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So gold glass gives that same look to the piece uh, that you're fusing with. Wow, a little bit. So good. So let's talk about the reactive glass next. So the reactive glass, if you use French vanilla, COE 90 with silver sheet, so you can get um, a silver sheet for a reasonable price and you just cut the tiniest little strip and put it on um, the piece of um, French vanilla. And then if you then cover it with aquamarine tiny frit, what happens is this kind of little explosion in the kiln on the glass. So French vanilla, wherever you see the little dots and you can see them around the outside, that's the um, aquamarine glass having a reaction to the French vanilla, which is a reactive glass. The blue kind of, uh, well, the blue shape that's in there, that's what the silver was. And as the glass um, expands in the kiln and it gets hotter, it pulls on that silver to give you some different shapes. What went in were square pieces of, sil pieces of silver sheet and strips of silver sheet. But you could see what happened in the kiln. It threw out some different shapes or different colors. <clears throat> Um, so the piece on the right is something that I made with it. Um, I used a couple of Druzy cabochons and this is the one that went into here. Um, so you can see there's some different things that you can do with it. 
Uh, I'll show you a couple of other things later uh, that I've made with some of the glass. <clears throat> Reactive is fun if you know what you're planning ahead of time. Um, you've, you can have reactions with, uh, one of the things that I used to do, like as a brand new glass artist is I would come home and I would like clean the glass up and I, that meant taking off the stickers, right? And I would take off the stickers that identified the glass and put them on a paper towel and then I would set them aside and um, that became my shopping list. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to go to bullseye next time and get this number, this number, this number. Problem is they don't sort it by number. So and they don't label the color and they'll tell you if it's reactive or they'll tell you and they'll tell you what the number is and the price, but that's it on the label. So what I started doing when I started opening the kiln and going, well, that's disappointing. <laughs> I don't like what that happened. So I started um, doing something different that I really like. And it's very helpful both to the person at Bullseye and to me to remember, oh, this is a mistake or I don't want to use this glass in that way again. So what I do is as it, as it first comes home, when I'm getting ready, I leave them alone, right? I don't touch the glass until I'm ready to use it. And then I cut off a piece of glass. I usually am trying to go for like a two by two square, which is big enough to keep the labels on. Um, and I may have to move the labels and relocate them onto this little two by two. And then when I use that glass and I open up the kiln and I see what the result was, I make a decision. Do I wanna put this in my shopping stack or not, right? And so um, I've got a little tiny plastic, you know, those photo plastic photo containers you can get at Michael's. I have one of those. And I'm, when I start with a new glass, I'll put that little two by two square in there. And it's very helpful to remember, you know, what I liked, what I didn't like about it. Mm, yeah, thank you, Paulette. Yeah, the, the reactive, I love the reactive. I love the way that it looks. There's just something about that combination of the blue and the cream that is, to me, it's beautiful. Thank you for that. <clears throat> textured glass, like what? We didn't have enough glass going on already. <laughs> Look at all those textures, so many. So the herringbone ripple, these are the guys where they start putting in those extra um, layers. Um, you're gonna get um, three millimeters is gonna be the thickness on these. It's also on the granite and the granite ripple three millimeters. Um, what's interesting about these is that you think you see blue and gold and maybe what looks like some white, it's actually not, it's the shine of the glass. Um, when I took the picture, it's the hot spots from the light. <clears throat> and then you've got this guy down here. So you think here, this is charcoal, maybe hematite color and the hematite where it's one color. Yeah, that's what's gonna come out baked. It holds some of the texture as it pulls. It holds the design, okay? But this one right here, lower left, we've got an orange, we've got a yellow, um, we've got maybe it's a dark blue, you can't really tell. Um, based on the picture, this was like the most colorful angle I could get of the glass. But when you bake this and you put a piece of clear over the top of it, and I like to put two pieces of clear over the top of this, and here's why because as it begins to expand and it's trying to pull to get to six millimeters, it's drawing out that texture and just kind of pulling it in different ways inside the kiln. And the most magnificent royal blue comes out and electric green come out and you don't know where they're gonna appear. And it's so gorgeous. I think I have a picture of it later in, in this. Uh, the granite ripple, this one, you can see there's a bunch of different colors in here this one would be a surprise, right? So you open up your kiln and you're like, wow, look at all the colors inside of there. So I would say, wait to oh, buy your beads until after you open your kiln. <laughs> um, crinkleized before. So you, they've done this new glass called crinkle. It's been for, I guess, probably eight years, at least um, eight years that I've known about it. So this is what it looks like before. It looks like just a plain piece of glass. And this is the crinkleized texture after. So it almost explodes and splinters and shards inside the kiln, so cool. But you wanna cover this with a piece of clear glass. Some of the dichros, they're fun to leave uncovered without clear glass because they're shinier and they're more vibrant and definitely draw your attention more. But the crinkleized actually has a sharp um, texture that will rip uh, like your sweaters or your nice clothing, it'll, it'll actually put a hole in them. And so I put a piece of um, the crinkleized glass over, or excuse me, the clear glass over the top of crinkle uh, before it bakes. 
um, reeded. There's tiny little valleys in this glass and um, it's, it's rolled and pushed and rolled and pushed and it makes this kind of um, a divot and a raised. The accordion has different, you can see how it's got different widths and it's actually um, a, a diagonal um, point. Prismatic is straight up and down, but it's larger valleys and different colors in the valleys. Um, renders really, really pretty. You'll get to see the example of this reed. Actually, let me just show it to you right now. Right here is that reed. So I've got this piece of design and I'll show you later how this came to be, but um, you'll see how this, this reed, I just put in a little piece that was kind of uh, probably about four inches long because that's about the size of the piece. And you'll see how it continued here and down to here based on the way that I had cooked it in the, in the kiln. You see all these colors in here, see the green and the dark blue. And then it just, it's even a darker blue. This is kind of a royal blue. There's even some like crazy purple in here. What questions do you have so far? Any questions? Okay. Um, metallics and dichroics. So even though these were previously pictured, um, this would be considered a metallic and this a dichroic, okay? Um, when I've cut, you can see the little clear piece of glass sitting on top of this. Uh, this is a sample of me playing with little tiny pieces that got, you know, either broken off when I was doing the, uh, the scoring and then the breaking with the grocers, uh, or it got, um, I cut them off intentionally, little tiny um, triangles or slivers, and I put them all together and I put in like in this one, for example, I have one, two, three, four, five pieces underneath, and these are one by ones. So um, one inch square. And so you can imagine how tiny these little triangles are, right? This is an interesting one. This has a black base. It has two orange triangles and then a blue green sliver that I went across the top. So the two, you see the two orange triangles are not together. This is how you can make some really interesting designs because as the kiln pulls, as the glass pulls, as it's heating up, it's going to pull into something really crazy that we're just, we just we may not recognize when it comes out. So this is pre-baking. Uh, now we're going to talk about river glass. So you're going to get a chance to see how that's made. And so I'm going to stop sharing this one. And go to the videos. Trying to get the sound. Can you guys hear that? Looks like um, a riverbed and they have dichroic glass on the bottom. And they are in. Welcome to the tutorial on how to make river glass cabochons. I'm going to show you a couple of them at first. And so these are a cabochon that I created that looks like um, a riverbed and they have dichroic glass on the bottom and they are encased with clear. Just show you a couple of different ones. I use these in bead embroidery. You can see how the color changes. This is my favorite one though. Using the um, green adventuring and you can kind of see some like electric dichroic green peeking up through there. If we turn it a little bit of a different way, it also gets a kind of a purple in there, but I'm not seeing that right now. So this is what's on tap for today. Get those out of the way. <clears throat> so what materials do I need for that? So I like to use Bullseye's Tecta glass. It's a really nice clear glass. I've already scored this. I have my waffle board and then I have my two, um, not even sure what you call these things, but they help me to keep the glass straight so that I get a decent straight line or a straight-ish line. Uh, this is my oil cutter. There is glass oil in there. So I've cut along here. 
<clears throat> I'm getting ready to use my running pliers to snap the glass and break it. So you can see, I don't know if you can see, there's a line right here. Can you see the line right there? Yeah. Here. Maybe you can't see it. Um, but the running pliers, they have this screw here. Well, this screw is always on top, okay? There's a reason for that, because if you look at the, the teeth, they're actually curved, okay? So we're gonna put this over and we're gonna line this little line right here that's on the plier top up with my line here on the glass. Let me give it just a little bit of a squeeze and you can see that it pops right off. I'll set that aside so he's not in our way. Now, the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm going to place a piece of dichroic glass underneath this and it's important that we make sure that our glass is clean. So what we're going to do to do that is we're going to spray it with a little bit of glass cleaner. It's important too to wash your hands before you start working with the glass because our hands have natural oils. And I've actually had somebody ask me before, won't spraying the glass with the glass cleaner actually take the color off? No, it will not. And this is just, you know, Walmart generic cleaner. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I am going to put this underneath. And in order to make it tack, because this is of two different um, lengths, so I've got my long piece here, I'm actually gonna get one more piece and I'm going to set that down right next to it. And I'm gonna leave this on top to just kind of get a sense of just how much more do I need to pull off. And I can see that it's about a waffle grid and a half. So I'm gonna move these guys out, set them down for just a minute. So I flipped it because uh, the side on the left where I first placed it down was a little off. It wasn't quite straight, but the other side was straighter. And I can't quite see that. So I'm going to move this little guy in so you can see it on the camera. Still can't see it, let me raise this up. One and a half, so I'm gonna go cut right about here. And then I'm gonna put my running pliers right on that line. And snap. Set the piece of glass aside. Now these should be the same size. Now why am I using two different colors of Dicro? Great question, I'm glad you asked. So what I'm going to do is actually make two different colors of this at the same time. And the very first thing that I'm going to do is take my glass tack. I'm gonna cover all of this, not terribly thick, just enough to be able to let it set. And then I might even use this since my hands are clean. I'll put this up against here. And now this sits perfectly. Now, what's next? Next is to take my frit. So for this, I'm going to use um, I think I'm going to use all of the green and maybe some of the larger pebbles with the brown. So what I have here is a mint opal deep forest green color mix. And so that's a little bit different than the color that we have in this particular cabochon. And so I'm going to pour some of these out on here. Kind of smear it around a little bit. I might even grit a few more of these. 
Now the glass, you want to be careful because it, it will, it will cut. Even the coarse frit can cut. There's sometimes a, a sharp edge and um, it, it, you have to be careful when you're like playing with it and pulling it in and out. So I tend to not dive my hand into the jar. So. Now I'm not gonna worry about the pieces that are falling by the wayside. And uh, in fact, I have even a little too much off of here. I'm gonna just dump those back later into their container after this dries. And so the value of having your clean workstation before you start with a new piece uh, or a new type of glass is that when I go to um, dump these back in, I'm not gonna cross contaminate with another color or a shard from something else. Okay, a few more of those. So what we want is enough for it to kind of fan out, but at the same time, not be too big. Not be too, too dense. Okay. So we're going to stop with the green on this color. And the next thing that we're going to introduce is a uh, number two color mix, extra large. And this is white, opal, and dark brown. And that is what made up this nugget, these nuggets. I really like this one because you can kind of decide where you want things and how big you want them. If you want to, if it's too much white in there, too much brown, you can kind of move some things around. Let's get a few more of these guys. So you can see the chunks are pretty big. They're a lot bigger compared to that. Now the very first thing that we're going to do after we get these kind of placed on here and we decide how many of them we want, is we are going to take our glass tack again. Let me cover the lid on this guy though. We're gonna take our glass tack again. Now, remember we did this on top of the die crow, but we did not do it on top of the actual clear glass. And what we're doing is just kind of putting some of this on here so that those little glass pieces are gonna dry. We're gonna leave this overnight, so we'll stop the video here. So one of the things that I did um, afterwards uh, is I, I recognized that I was tired when I was making this video. And so the top piece of dichroic is a two millimeter piece of dichroic and the bottom is a three millimeter. So when I went out the next morning to get this, I found that the two pieces of glass underneath had not stuck together. The glass tack did not work on them. So I took um, the two underneath and I switched them because I recognized also, oh, I put the wrong color of glass with the green and the, the other color. So I had to switch them up. And then I turned over uh, the piece of um, clear that has our little um, chunks of frit on it. And I scored it in the middle and I baked them separately because it just seemed like it was gonna be a little bit easier. So let me go ahead and then move to this. So they've, let me uh, show you, hang on here, stop out here. you this again so this was me filling up the water okay this was me putting in um the glass uh before um to bake and so it's in the kiln and you can see it's on this tiny little piece of um this is after i had tile sawed it so uh let's see let me find that other video for you so I use the tile saw. I'm not going to leave this whole thing go because it's noisy. Okay. But it'll show you the tile saw in action. So here's the piece that's been baked. And what happens is when it comes out, some of the clear will sometimes spill over and the edges are not perfect exact. Okay. So what I do um, for myself is I tend to cut off some of the excess um, clear and you'll see that happening in this video.
two pieces of clear flying off to the side on the right. And I do this with all four sides. So I'll stop there and ask you, did you see pieces of dichroic glass flying off to the right? I don't throw those away. So I'll save those. And then later, if I want just a, a hint of color in something, or I want to make some kind of weird mashup, you know, maybe I want to make a coaster for my coffee cup, I will throw all those uh, weird pieces in and bake them together. And um, I, it's some kind of cool surprise. So this is basically all that happens. Um, I do take it further. Let me jump ahead here. Now I'm cutting it into different pieces. So you'll see how I held on to both pieces on the top and the bottom of the glass. Super important because if you're only holding on to it from the bottom, the, the top part of your glass starts to raise up, right? <clears throat> like it's gonna take off and run away from you. Still holding up to the top and the bottom. And the rest of it's just cutting it into some smaller pieces. Uh, and then here is our kiln reveal. Okay, I've opened the kiln and we're going to pick up some of our pieces and we're going to see the wonderful See how that's got a back color that's in them as we put them into our vinegar bowl. When you're pulling your glass out of the kiln, mm. um, pop it into a dish with vinegar in it, white vinegar. Such good color. It helps clean the glass. To jump ahead here to some of the other colors. Look at that one. So this is our river glass. Some of these are not a perfect shape, so I'm actually going to spend some time glass grinding those. Not during this video, though. Look at the fire. Oof. We'll get the last pieces in here. Almost reminds me of like an opal. This is a really pretty one. I'm going to stop us there. What questions do you have? Let's see, so we may maybe have a question in here. Oh, love that river glass. Yeah, I love that stuff. Uh, so quickly, uh, fusing versus slumping versus tacking, um, tack fusing. Uh, so the fused glass, um, where you have more, one or more pieces, you're going to fire at full fire for uh, just a full fuse. It's at the highest temp and it has um, varying ramps and holds. And what that means is we're going to go up to a certain temperature and hold for 10 to 40 minutes, depending. Slumped glass, you've already done your full fuse and now you're wanting to create a shape on it. And that shape um, becomes uh, whatever you want it to. Um, so I, I invented uh, the curved dichroic glass piece for um, bracelets for bead embroidery. Um, I've done hair pieces, barrettes with them. Um, it, it does require a separate type of um, stainless steel mold in order to get the barrette shape. Uh, the arc from uh, the bracelet piece is the wrong arc for it. Um, Tack is used to maintain shape and stick each layer together. So the first thing that I did with the river glass was I put it through a tack cycle. So it just grabbed the glass and stuck to it. Um, the, the thing is <clears throat> about this is every kiln is different. So I can't give you a kiln schedule that says, hey, go use this in your kiln. Every kiln is different. Um, and so what you wanna do first is follow your manufacturer's recommendation for each of these three types of schedules and get to know your kiln, right? Look, take a look at it and oh, that was too hot or that wasn't hot enough. Um, it feels more like a tack, whatever. Um, this is uh, how um, that particular piece looked. Uh, so I took a, 12, a 10 by 10 piece of glass and I cut up a whole bunch of dichroic glass and then I covered it with clear. 
and I baked it as a 10 by 10. And then I took my tile saw and I whacked it into pieces and got all of these different things out of it. This is from taking the edge of stacked glass. So you can stack seven layers. Um, it'll, it'll pour out, uh, it won't go to six millimeters, but what it will do is go to about a half of an inch. You tile saw it and you can see all the layers on the inside. And then I decided to um, put some dichroic uh, glass on top of that and see what happened with it. So experiments, experiments. Uh, here are some of the things that I've made. This is the curved dichroic um, band for bead embroidery. Uh, this one, Sherry Serafini beaded. And uh, this one I did. So we had an example of a hard cuff and a soft cuff. And then this is uh, the necklace I showed you earlier where you could see the reeds. Thank you, Joanne. And then of course, no presentation would be complete without introducing you to the family. So we have Sapphire, my cow. She is uh, 14 um, and she has lived her best life. Uh, she is a Holstein <clears throat> and she's never, we've never milked her. She thinks she's a dog. I think if we tried to milk her, if we had freshened her, she would be like shocked beyond belief. Uh, Chester, uh, he, you get two pictures of Chester because he's the love of my life on four legs. And then Lucy, uh, who is our kitty who adopted us. So thank you so much for having me tonight. A lot of fun. What questions do you, do you have? Do you sell any of your pieces? Uh, I do, your... but I don't have any up on my website right now. Uh, I've got to do, I've got to do some more baking and some more photographing, <clears throat> but yes, I do. Um, I can let Rochelle know when I post some up, if y'all are interested in. Cool. That'd be great. Awesome. Thank you so much. And if you guys decide that you want to try one, your hand at one of those um, <clears throat> curved dichroic uh, bands, I'll post some of those too. And um, it comes with a pattern that tells you how to beat around that type of glass because it's, it's got a little trick to it. Oh, that'd be fantastic. That's what I was looking for exactly is that yeah. round and the bracelet so you hit the nose on the head cool cool <clears throat> thank you so much thank that you. was really interesting and a very lot more um detailed than i would have thought oh thank you i love it love it thank you so much I click glass i used to i'm a rock hound too but then my oh. second love is glass <laughs> Yeah, it's hard not to like glass. I will forewarn you if you if you have any kind of, you know, feeling that you might like to do this, I'll forewarn you right now. Just start looking in your um, looking in your uh, garage to see where you're going to set up your studio. <laughs> I do stained glass, and a lot of the you use a lot of the same tools. And if you're going to start this as a hobby, I can warn you: in any glass, it can be very expensive and add up quickly. Yeah. I actually joke that um, I get my check and then Bullseye gets my check. <laughs> um, yeah. Somebody asked in the chat if there was clear on top of the river glass. There is. Yeah, because it helps pull it out and it helps open up that dichroic glass more. So I have something to show you on that note. And that is, what does it look like when you put it up against... Um, let me see if I can get the right angle where you start to see the colors. So this is against white and this is against black, same glass. Wow. wow. Difference. Really? Oh, there Beautiful. you go. There you can see the colors. Yeah, wow. it's very different. So very, wow. very different. And you, I don't know if you've, uh, you know, what your preference is. My preference is always the bolder, the better. And if you can get orange in it, I'm already in love with it. So yeah, mm -hmm. so this is an example. The other thing I want to show you is, and I don't, I don't know if you can see this in here or not. And actually, do I have, I should have the video. Hang on here. It's like a black opal. Yeah, right? Well, to create a lot of that, a lot of times you put color in your resin when you're adhering your clear opals to something and it gives it the black background. And so you can do it with rocks as well as the glass. So this, it doubles and triplets. This is a piece of river glass. And this was actually of the first batch that I ever made. 
and I saved it because it tells an ugly story. And that is this, um, you don't wanna open your kiln until it's about 190 or less degrees. All the manufacturers say 200. I opened this at 201 thinking one degree is not a big deal. <laughs> one degree is a big deal. So it's a thermal I shock. I think this is a beautiful cabochon until I turn it just a little bit to the side. And if you can see like right here, there's kind the of a, a white shape. And then mm -hmm. right there as well. If you go ahead and you follow that, there's actually a line. You can see it all right here. That's what's called a thermal crack. And that results from opening the kiln before it has cooled below 200 degrees. Yeah. Yeah, and they're very sad when you open them up and you see that. You're just like, oh, so sad. <laughs> wow, well, after all that work and then it goes. No, up. right? <laughs> I keep mean, I keep thinking maybe I should just throw it back in the kiln and see what happens, but it's such a good lesson for, you know, teaching people not to open that. Kiln before. <laughs> and, um, and my kiln is fussy. My kiln doesn't want to be opened before about 190 degrees. So. So how long does it normally take then from start to finish to make one piece? I have an understanding from dry time or cook time, but you know, generally. Yeah. Um, I would say actual work, you're probably about 20 minutes. Actual firing time included, um, three, two to three days, depends on how much you're running the kiln. So, um, and cause each cycle takes about, we'll see the, 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 the tax cycle on my kiln takes like nine hours to get the kiln cool enough. It's only a five hour cycle, but it takes four more hours to get the kiln cool enough to open. And then the full fuse cycle is over 13 hours. And, uh, and then when I cut them, right, Tile saw them, that video, I think it was a six minute video. I had them all cut up. Um, and then I put those into full fuse. So another 13 plus hours, yeah. So that's just the cooking and whatnot. That's not the shaping, the grinding, all yeah, that. No, yeah. see, and, so, and I, got, I got lucky with this one. This one is a beautiful shape, but this um, one is just a hair off. So I would either want to fix that or I'm going to use it and then um, like put some additional, um, you know, filigree or beads up here to kind of draw attention to that corner so that people don't notice that it's off, you know? Um, <clears throat> but yeah, if I were then to take, and, and shape it, uh, the shaping is probably a good half an hour um, on, the, on the diamond, excuse me, on the um, glass grinder, which with the diamond bit, and it also spews water. Um, and then you have to full fuse it again. Oh, wow, you fuse it again after you grind it. Okay, yeah, wow. Yeah, because what happens is when you do that full, that fusion, what you get, remember earlier, we talked about if you wanna make glass matte, you're gonna do the diamond um, bar right and it's the same thing with the glass grinder the the bit on it is diamond and so as you're um doing that you're making the glass matte and so you have to put it through another um another full fuse or a fire polish fuse which on my kiln is about seven hours wow so i usually have something else i can put into full fuse so i just toss it back in with that do you teach um any place um because i know sometimes there's some different um um I'm trying to think what I want to say, organizations that have different um, capabilities of having teachers. And sometimes they're, you know, people that work with glass or whatever, and they have the kilns and all that. Do I, I don't, um, I haven't uh, to date and I, and I probably won't. Um, but what I am planning on doing, because I realized that um, by setting up for this class, to create some videos for you is like, okay, I could totally do a YouTube channel. So I think that that's probably what I'm going to do because then I don't have to travel and I don't have to worry about, you know, any of the stuff that's going on in our world. Um, I have a bit of a compromised immune system. So I tend to want to be protective of, of going out. <clears throat> so um, in fact, my husband has done all the grocery shopping and everything. I've left my house like 12 times since COVID started. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I have a, a comment. <laughs> um, I'm sorry to say that the last two stained glass stores in Minneapolis are in St. Paul area are now in the process of retiring and closing. 
And so we won't have any place here locally to go buy glass anymore. It'll all have to be online. Yeah. Bullseye has got some fantastic photos. Mm -hmm. You can tell exactly what it looks like. They'll even show you a before fuse and after fuse. So you can see if it's a reactive glass. They're really good at labeling. Um, they're my favorite place in terms of purchasing for supplies. And um, AAE Glass has uh, the cheapest dichroic um, factory packs. So if you're interested in classes, bull and you're in the Washington, Oregon area, Bullseye does give classes. Mm -hmm. So they do. And I have kind of a funny story to tell. We were getting our kitchen remodeled and it was a glass mosaic back, back wall. And uh, they bring it in and put it up. And one of the square pieces had to be cut with an inside 90 degree angle and it cracked. And I asked him to replace it. And he, he said, no, he couldn't because it was too hard to do. And I said, no, you just need a diamond saw. And he gave me this really weird look and then just kind of brushed me off until it came time for me to sign off on the project. And I said, everything is fine except for the broken piece of glass. And then he decided he would fix it. And he had a little sheet of extra pieces of the mosaics. And I said, well, just give me that big piece and I'll take it downstairs and cut it. It doesn't have to be a right angle. It's a mosaic piece, we'll just fit it in there. And he goes, you're gonna do what to it? <laughs> I said, yeah, I'll just take it downstairs and cut it and then grind off the edge. Yeah. He goes, okay. Yeah. I mean, you can do all kinds of things with that. Um, one thing I'll tell you about the frit, a uh, quick short story. Um, the frit. So how many of you bake? You like to bake? Mm -hmm. Sprinkle mm -hmm. stuff? Yeah. Don't do that with the tiny frit or the powdered frit because it's really going to... I nursed my three bloody fingers that were so sore after doing this with Frit, trying to get the right little, because <laughs> I was too cheap to buy the little sprinkler, you know? <laughs> I immediately went and bought the sprinkler. <laughs> um, somebody has asked, what's my energy bill like? Uh, the energy bill when uh, we did not have solar was, uh, and I was fusing all the time, worked out to about $4 a fuse. Wow. So every time. Yeah. It's a little pricey, but you build that in. If you're going to make this and sell it, you build that into the cost, you know? Um, but now that we have solar, <laughs> they owe us. <laughs> so get, get solar and then get your kill. <laughs> well, it depends on where you live. Solar doesn't help us a whole lot in Minnesota when it's so cloudy, snowy, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. You can only get about half time of your energy. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. You we got our bill and it was only a few dollars. We were like, yes, we just got our solar installed. Oh, good. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it was pretty, the sh it went from hundred, a couple hundred to 30. It was very interesting. Um, you so, you there. so Karen, where are you out of? What, what state? Tracy, California. Oh, cool. Yeah. That's great. We're just so excited that you could show us so many things that we'll, you know, I, I, I mean, it's so intensive that I, I have a whole new respect for, you know, just the amount of layers and layers and time. And how does Jamie Kawahara do dichroic seed bead, Icos? I mean, that uh, key is the craziness. Is, yeah, I wish she still did. She doesn't anymore. I know, yeah. but I paid so much for one gram of those beads because they're so pretty. And so- yeah. Back I mean, that train up who? Something else. I missed something. Yeah, Jamie Kawahara used to make dichroic Icos. And, um, and the process to make them is to place them in a vacuum chamber. And so, I mean, she spent, you know, a lot of money creating the vacuum chamber, getting um, everything set up right to do that because the process of, of creating dichroic glass is, is um, putting in metal inside of a vacuum chamber and it splatters and it goes where it needs to go. And um, you can do it with designs. Uh, I haven't seen how that's done, but yeah. She, I had um, a couple of, in fact, that that last piece that I had showed you has a uh, dichroic um, Icos. I, I had the blue and then I had the red, which used to be that orange, remember? 
Yes. Oh yeah. my gosh. So they're both on that piece that I showed you. I'm like, oh, it's my favorite piece. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It's just I'm story. jealous. I wish she was still doing it. I yeah. Know. I wish she was too. Yeah. They were eighteen dollars for one gram. gram increments is how she sold them, and so <laughs> that's why you buy one gram at a time. Exactly, and use it on the most precious piece you can, and then you know. That's why you have Christmas and and Hanukkah and Valentine's Day and your birthday and St. Patrick's Tuesday. Day. <laughs> yeah, Tuesday. I like that Tuesday. Uh, Any no. day ending with a Y. That's right. Yeah. That's now right. you can get a cavachon from Karen and then bezel around it and do a beautiful embroidery project and. Uh, We'll so be so excited. So you just let us know when you have some ready and we'll okay. have a bead shopping internet Zoom. You know, bead oh, that would be fun. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. A trunk show, you know, out of your house. Yeah. Oh, I'd love that. And I want to get a round one with a black background. <laughs> <laughs> I already know what I want. All right. <laughs> We're getting excited, Karen. So you just right. know. Thank you so much. I appreciate you all coming tonight and um, just being here and bringing questions and happy energy and all of that. So thank you so much. Have thank you so much. Have it was a lovely very evening. Fantastic presentation. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.